The reading from Emmett Fox is titled Training Your Thoughts. Thought is a real positive force in life and there is no other. You could not have one kind of mind in another kind of environment. You cannot change your environment while leaving your mind unchanged. This is the real key to life. If you change your mind, your conditions must change too. Your body must change. Your activities must change. Your home must change. And the color tone of your whole life must change. And there's a scripture from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This may be called the great cosmic law. The practical difficulty in applying it arises from the fact that our thoughts are so close to us that it is difficult without a little practice to stand back and look at them objectively. Yet that is just what you must learn to do. You must train yourself to choose the subject of your thinking at any given time and also to choose the emotional tone. If you are not determined to start in now and carefully select all day the kind of thoughts that you're going to think, you may as well give up all hope of shaping your life into the kind of thing that you want it to be. The way to start on a seven day mental diet is to begin now. Thank you. Well, given the time of the year, I decided to explore miracles. Uh, the title is The Unexpected Miracle at an Awkward Time. And I'm going to start by talking about the one most clearly related to this time in the Christian tradition, uh, the, the, the birth of Jesus. And I, before I get into it, I want to remind those of you who I, I attended my talk about when Jesus was ugly, that this is a carry on to that. And if you missed that talk, uh, if you go to our website, um, the recording of it is there because these are sort of part and parcel with what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I, I, I think it'll be clear enough even if you did not catch that talk. So I wanna step away from the myths around the birth of Jesus. You recall when I talked about the ugly Jesus, that is what the one reliable writer of the time said about Jesus. He was bandy-legged, he was small, he had a scraggly beard and a pump back. But then as Christianity strove for acceptance by high society, shall we say, they prettied him up until the 1500s when he became the, uh, shall we say, uh, the white well-trimmed God uh, in a white outfit. Uh, and then the one that currently is in vogue, which was done by a in pencil by a fellow with, in, who published a Christian magazine, I believe it was in 1910. Uh, but that wasn't what the original followers, the original followers were quite content not to be following the current trend because back then any God who was a God had to be handsome, had to be powerful in all the wonderful ways, had to be a warrior. Uh, and they did not see that as necessary. Well, think about the birth of Jesus. First of all, according to George Lamsa, who comes from the tradition that Jesus was raised, the words used to describe the, Mary, the wedded Mary is she's one of several wives. Lamsa writes that she was probably married before the time that she could legally be a wife, if you will. Um, and it was not uncommon when a ch uh, child needed caretaking that a girl child would be married off to an older man who would promise to bring her up to care for her 
until such time as she could become his bedded wife or bettable wife, uh, to be not too bald about it. And the what I want to look at is the concept of awkwardness and unexpected miracles, not only from back then, but coming forward. So here we have a gal who is pregnant before she's supposed to be. And this husband, who by societal norms would appear to have broken his vow to take good care of her until she was of marriageable, bettable age. Oh my God, she's pregnant by him, sort of thing. Uh, so he appears to have broken societal norms. And here they are, according to the story, forced to go to Bethlehem. Now, bear in mind that there's no history, no text uh, that anyone has found indicating that there was a census called where they had to, tra to, to travel to Bethlehem. So this probably is a construct to try to add validation to Jesus' birth from the Jewish uh, testimonial and prophetic tradition, but we'll go with it. So here's this kid, he's born in the stable. Now, when you see stables these days, oh, it's clean, it's nice, it's well lit, but heck, houses weren't well lit. And the houses of the poor back then were probably dirt floor, just as they were in this country for most of our time. So th think of a stable probably dirt floored. Chances are a strong smell of manure. Chances are, unless Joseph found some fresh straw, that she was not on the freshest of straw. And birth is not a pretty thing, and it leaves a fair amount of mess behind. So all these things fit with the idea also of the ugly Jesus, that we are talking a divine who is the, if you will, the anti-hero, who is not seeking to be elevated above the rest of us or the followers. Um, you know, until the bureaucratic Christianity took over and decided to pretty everything up because, you know, who who wants to worship this guy who was born in a stable among the manure uh, covered with blood? Because, you know, it's not a pretty thing when you get born. Um, you know, that just sort of gets wiped away. But think of Joseph. How awkward was that moment? Was that whole time? And yeah, a kid was born and the kid survived. That was a miracle in itself back then. Only later did the full miracle of what happened become evident only later to us sometimes does the miracle show become evident of that awkward time well think about uh think about paul here's this guy who's on a mission to kill all the christians or believers in christ i don't know if they called themselves christian back then and going down the path, he suddenly ends up in the middle of nowhere, blind, talking to somebody or some buddies. What are the people around him thinking? He's gone crazy. Well, they have enough pity, so they take him by the hand, they lead him to the next village and drop him off. This is not a particularly positive note for a guy who's very proud of himself and very proud of his mission on behalf of the Jews. He's going to go someplace. You know, he had ambition. The miracle we know is he had an epiphany. He had a direct contact with the divine, which completely changed his life trajectory. Of course, he too got hyped up over the years as the Christian authorities needed to show how powerful everything excuse me, everything was. What I want you to think about for the moment is how this fits with the, idea, with the concept of the ugly Jesus too. We're talking 
an original faith that did not put on airs. That in fact, if you will, accepted the undercurrent of life and that their divine was mixed right in with the poor that Jesus served anyway. You know, think about it. Here's a guy, doesn't matter whether he was handsome or bandy-legged for the moment, who hung around with the lowest of the low, the poorest, the ones who, if walking down a path, a rich man's coming the other way and he feels like killing someone can stab him and nobody's going to blink an eye. And the Christians were content with the divine who walked among them. It doesn't look like a miracle at the start. Now, did Jesus, as it is reported, go stand on a stage and invite people to come up and get healed? Get healed right now, come to Jesus. No, that wasn't the experience of the original Christians. They weren't trying to build up a magical Jesus who could outcompete all the other gods who were born of a virgin. Because of course, any God who was a God back then needed to be born of a virgin and have magical powers. Not this guy. We don't know about the magical virgin, but he wasn't promoting himself. He wasn't even claiming to start a new faith. He was by his being demonstrating a way of being so different from anything else that people knew. He wasn't preaching tribalism. You know, I can do anything I want to you because you're not of my tribe. He was preaching that all of us are together. He was a spiritual teacher who spoke truths but did not value himself or pump on, you know, pump on his chest. He was teaching them how to survive. He was teaching them about a, a divine who loved them. How, no matter how, sort of like Gandhi did. Gandhi was not of the lowest classes and yet he lived among them. He wove like they did. And the original Christians understood the message. They did not follow as the King James and so many Bibles, American or English written Bibles say, a jealous God. George Lamsa insists that the actual word was zealous. They lived a life following a zealous God filled with love. And why did Christianity grow? It wasn't that they were going preaching hellfire and brimstone, just as Quakerism. When George Fox walked around, he wasn't preaching hellfire and brimstone. They were teaching that there's that spark of God within each one of us. And according to one academic I've read, the reason Christianity started to grow with these unprepossessing folks who believed in the teachings of this guy, Jesus Christ, was what they did. When the plagues came, everyone who could fled to the mountains, fled to the, uh, to the countryside where they could ideally stay safe from the plague. The Christians saved and took care of those who were dying or those who were sick. They buried them. Many of them died because they were showing caring. Much like in COVID today, many of those who are caregivers know the risk. And yet they are standing by their caring for humanity 
And when there were hard times and food was scarce, those who had no food knew that if they went to the Christians, the Christians would pray for them. They would care for them. They would share food with them. Now, if you went to any of the other temples, oh, they'd do something for you, but you had to pay them or you had to bring a sacrifice, which is food that uh, all the priests could eat. So we had, if you will, an unprepossessing circumstance that generated so many miracles. And it is the divine that we follow. Remember, you know, I talk about Richard Rohr and his understanding now of the cosmic Christ, that the message of the Christ has come to many people, to perhaps to all peoples we can say, from different mouths in slightly different forms, but the message is still there. Now, an undertow of all this is uh, my take. Be there, beware of those who produce miracles on demand or demand from you so you can experience a miracle that they'll work for you, allegedly. They're no different from all the temples to all the other gods. You are expected to give in order to get. Very transactional. That was not what Jesus the Christ taught. That was not what the original followers of Christ taught. They did. And in doing so, they touched the hearts and brought truth of love and a God who loved not because you paid him to, because you were intrinsically worthwhile. Awkwardness comes to miracles in our lives too. And if you think about it, and over this week, I encourage you to consider it. Where have you had an awkward experience and later on realized it brought an unexpected miracle? As I was writing this, I found myself thinking of uh, a, Robert, a line from Robert Faust, and I changed it a bit. God comes in on little cat feet. And when we are living, whether it's in the fog of life or in the snowstorm of life, or lying on a sunny beach somewhere in the Azores, we need to be open to sensing those little cat feet coming to us. And particularly for those of us such as attend this church, we as spiritual people who ideally are comfortable with spiritual guidance coming out of nowhere, spiritual experience coming out of nowhere, who are comfortable with the spiritually inexplicable, we need to be ready for that cat to leap unexpectedly into our lives so we can enjoy in it, so we don't freak out during the awkward part and so that we can benefit from it. And you know, God works in weird ways. Uh, last night, he gave me a story about awkwardness Actually, it started two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, uh, I was on the way back from picking up books for our books for the needy in a small town somewhere or other. And I stopped at a convenience store to pick up a, a soda because I drank all the water I had. And I went up to the checkout and it was a busy place. There were lots of people behind me. And when she rang it up, it was 50 cents more than it said on the sign. And I said, hey, the sign says buck 49. Oh, she says, well, it says this here. Well, can you change it? Well, uh, I'd have to go back and I looked at all the people back there. I was feeling awkward. So I said, I'll just go ahead and pay it. On the way home, I thought about that and thought, how would I do it differently next time? Okay, so that was the start of the awkwardness. Yesterday, I became aware that my hair is well past trimming and needing trimmed. And 
as I've shared with you in previous ones, right now my finances are tight. So I've been trading with a gal who used to do hair when she was in the mission field, but she's gone for how many months taking care of a family emergency. And so I started thinking, you know, you can get a hair clipper for not too much. And I asked Mary if she might be willing to uh, try trimming my hair. So I started looking and I found, you know, they're normally running 20 bucks and up. And I found one on sale at Walgreens for 15 bucks. And what you do is you order, and then you go to the store and pick it up when they notify you they've got it ready for you. So I placed an order at the nearest store and 20 minutes later, it came back. Sorry, it's out of stock. Now, that's not what Oral Green said in their list because they list whether it's in stock or not. So I went to the next store and ordered. 40 minutes later, I hadn't heard anything. It was getting close to their closing time. So I called them up and said, uh, I, I need to know if you're going to, you know, when you're going to have this ready so I know when to pick it up tonight or tomorrow. And she said, give me a minute. Came back and said, we're out of stock. Okay, so now it's approaching nine. And I don't know why I felt the need to do this, but I kept working on it. There was one more place. And so I placed an order there for there. And Walgreens wouldn't take my order. Wouldn't take the credit card. I tried another credit card. Wouldn't take the credit card. And I knew they were both good. Okay. So there's one open at 10 o'clock. Allegedly it has one. I still have no idea why I'm feeling the urgency to do it tonight. But uh, so Phyllis gets done with a phone call and she and I drive up to that store and I walk in, they show me where the clippers are. And by gosh, there's a there's the same clipper brand, same clipper package, but it's got more goods in it. And they've knocked it down, uh, remaindered it for 11 bucks. So $23 product, uh, Walgreen, uh, Walgreen online was offering it for 15. Now it's down to 11. And it has more stuff in it that I was going to need. So I take it, take it to the counter. I end up being the last one in the long line. And I think everyone else, there was no one else in the store except the workers. And I get to the counter and she rings it up. Oh, that's 1895. Um, 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 Ma'am, there's a sign back there that says $11. Oh, really? I've got to go check. There was nobody behind me. And I'd already done the mistake of letting it go through once before. So I was prepared. And so she went back, came back, says, I think this is for yours. Went over to the, to the store manager, got permission to ring it up that way. And so I got everything I needed except one special scissors, scissors for 12 bucks plus tax instead of 23 or 16 plus tax plus shipping. Awkwardness. Hey, that's not what the price was. But there was nobody behind me, so I didn't feel like I was inconveniencing anybody else. And I got what I needed more than what I expected to be able to get for 15 bucks. Small miracle, unexpected miracle. With some awkwardness. You know, through the whole thing, I could at any point have thrown up my hands and said, well, the heck with this. This obviously isn't working or anything like that. This is where following leadings, they only had two there. It was indeed a closeout. And the other one looked a little beat up. So if I'd waited till Saturday, Sunday morning, would I have found either one? Don't know. Would it have been such an agreeable cashier? I don't know. Would I have had a whole bunch of people behind me so I would have felt more awkward about uh, raising a question? I don't know, but I'll give God the credit because now I have what I need so I can get my hair cut. A small miracle, but one I'm very grateful for because I got what I needed and saved what, nine bucks, about half what I would have expected to spend for everything I needed. If you look in your life over this coming week, consider the times that have been awkward. 
and the miracles that came from them. I'm not saying every awkward time will generate a miracle, but often awkwardness has something to do with what the miracle happens. When you encounter an awkward moment or an awkward situation, embrace it. Recognize that this may be the prelude to the divine working something special in your life. Say thanks for whatever miracle is going to come, if there's a miracle to come. Be prepared for it to come from any angle. You were talking unexpected miracles. Yeah, I would never have thought that God would intervene to save me nine bucks. That's what happened. So in the awkwardness, you know a miracle may come. Be aware that you may not have any idea and probably won't have any idea the how or the when. I'm aware of one awkwardness that for privacy reasons of the other people involved, I won't mention. That was one of the most painful episodes in my life and most embarrassing. It took about 20 years before I realized what the miracle had been that came from that awkwardness. And I can say I am without doubt. Well, I didn't like that awkwardness. I like the, the miracle that came from it. It's okay for you to know that there are tiny miracles happening frequently in your life, whether you see them or not, whether there is awkwardness or not. It's not a one, two combination. It's just that often there will be awkwardness in preparation for whether you know it or not. I think of them as unheralded miracles because we can be going on our daily way and miss the miracle here or there or somewhere else. Listen for those little cat feet of miracles. Be willing to say thank you, to acknowledge the miracle. Allow the cat feet of God, the cat feet of miracles to meander through your life. We don't need to be in control. Uh, in our spiritual walk, it is far better not to be in control to know that the divine is in control and we're doing our best to listen, to follow, to set a good example on behalf of the one loving God. So do when you are aware of a miracle, whether yours or somebody else's, acknowledge it. Give thanks to the divine to ev for everyone that we become aware of. Give thanks for the unacknowledged, the unheralded, miracles that have shaped our lives. One that comes to me right now, I'm alive. When I was born, I was born eight weeks premature at a time when I'm told preemies that early, you know, a lot of them didn't survive. And here I am not only survived, but I'm healthy, reasonably. For 72 years old, pretty damn good. Okay, I need to give credit to God for that and for where I find myself because he's the one who worked the miracles to get me where I am here. And like the original Christians, are you prepared just by your actions, by showing your caring to be part of someone else's miracle? Last week, Phyllis mentioned someone that we, he showed up at our doorstep uh, and He'd been knocked about as flat as one can be flat without being run over by a tank. Uh, had no resilience, no hope. And a, a number of you, when Phyllis talked about it, stepped in and helped this way or that way. He called this morning or texted this morning. He just got a job. And he said, without the caring that our congregation had shown, he doesn't know he could have even been going around looking for work. He was that utterly hopeless. Now, will he join a church? Probably not. But you know what? 
he saw the example of people who can care simply because he is, and by our standards, is a child of God. And that leads me to a close. Uh, Paul Buckley, a Quaker theologian, sends me uh, meditations once a week. And he sent me one just recently that seems appropriate here as something to, for you to meditate on this week. And this is a quote from Ramon Gonzalez Langoria Escalone. I believe that now more than ever, we must seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our ministry and ministry is walking through life. Quakers believe just our walking through life is a ministry. So I'm gonna start over again. So it fits in context. I believe that now more than ever, we must seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our ministry, being attentive listeners, but above all, good agents of God's will. And expand that to being part of God's will is to accept his miracles, his unexpected miracles, and even his awkwardnesses in our lives. <laughs>